they will send the question to us and they will give us some time to do it. And then we submit, we submit it when we finish. Maybe they will give it to us and they will give us a deadline then. Okay, so that's I'm not sure. And I guess it's subject to change. So maybe that's the project part. Oh, okay. But yeah, but uh, there may be an exam, like you, you have to attend an exam. It's not giving you some questions mm -hmm. and uh, receiving the answers after, I don't know, two, three or a week. But uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. So uh, I guess everybody is here. Uh, we have, okay. So, uh, in the last session, we talked about uh, engineering seismology and how engineering seismology relates earth sciences to engineering. And we introduced ground motion prediction equations, the independent parameters, the most famous independent parameters, the dependent parameters like PGA and spectral uh, coordinates like uh, pseudo spectral acceleration or pseudo spectral velocity. We di discussed different uh, definitions of earthquake magnitude uh, and how we use earthquake magnitude to describe the source term. Then uh, we also discussed different uh, measures of uh, distance, source to site distance, and how these different types of distance can affect our ground motion prediction. We also introduced site effect briefly and how we can incorporate this side effect in our equation. <clears throat> and uh, now we will talk about some uh, points in analysis techniques. When we collected all the independent parameters and, param and uh, dependent parameters, and now we want to estimate the unknown coefficients in a GMPE. And uh, here we face some problems and we will briefly describe them. So uh, the main problem is because of in uh, uh, homogeneities in terms of independent parameters of most strong motion data sets. The first one is that in most uh, a strong motion sets, there is a strong correlation between magnitude and distance of record. So that, I mean, this is because the, the large earthquakes can be detected at greater distances than a small earthquakes. So here you can see an example of a graph uh, that shows moment magnitude values versus hypocentral distance from Iranian strong motion data set. And you see that at large distances, you only have large earthquakes, right? For example, at 150 kilometer, you don't have any earthquake from magnitude less than five. And all the distant records are related to large earthquakes. So it makes the distance and magnitude as independent parameters to be correlated to each other. The other point is that <clears throat> there is a large number of accelerograms from large distances. And you, you for example, you can see that you have too many uh, strong motion records in this area. And there is a still a lack of near field data in this region. You see that you, for example, less than 20 kilometer number of the recordings are quite small. And this is actually the region that 
is very much important for engineering purposes. Near field data is quite important for engineering purposes because they can, most of the damage can occur in these distances. So this is another pro uh, problem. And the other problem is that in your catalog, sometimes you find some earthquakes that uh, occurred in a region with large number of accelerographs. So in some region, you have too many uh, strong motion sensors and one earthquake occurs them at the, and, and uh, then as a result, you will have too many records of just that earthquake. So an example is here. So this is a catalog of the earthquakes occurred in Iran and the third column. So this is the date and time. And uh, the third column is the number of recordings for each earthquake. The, at the bottom, you see all the PGA values, one of the horizontal components against, uh, against epicentral distance. So this one is for sure uh, an outlier. And regardless of that, you see that almost all the records are in the uh, distance range uh, less than 400 kilometer. And this figure is just the PGA values related to this one, this very well recorded earthquake with 148 recordings. So comparing the first 400 kilometer of this figure and this figure, you will realize that most of this, uh, the, the, the uh, PGAs in this region are related actually to just one earthquake. And even taking a look at this column, you will see that, okay, this earthquake have 100 and 148 recordings. But for example, there are some, I, I don't know, the, the, this one is, I guess, uh, this earthquake has the next larger number of recording that it's just 33. So this is an example of the problem number three that we already discussed. So here <clears throat> we take a look at the techniques that uh, have been applied by previous studies, mainly uh, early studies to solve this problem. So the first problem was uh, presence of correlation between magnitude and distance. So the solution for that is to apply a technique introduced by Joyner and Bohr in 1981 uh, called two-stage res uh, regression. And uh, so in this uh, technique, you first uh, drive the distance dependent coefficients of your equation. And then in the second step, the magnitude dependent coefficients are estimated. So the next problem, uh, we will see how, how it works in, in the next lectures. I mean, something similar to that one. So the next problem is that a large number of records with similar magnitudes. So a solution to that one is that uh, you can set of records is split up, split up to 24 different magnitude site intervals. So you divide, you, you split up your uh, data set to, for example, 24 magnitude and site intervals. And the magnitude site and uh, confidence interval dependent coefficients are calculated using one PGA from each interval. So you actually bin your data set in uh, uh, magnitude and site intervals. And then you will pick one PGA from each 
been to use for the regression. Then it will solve the problem that, okay, for, for example, you have too many recordings from just magnitude of, for example, 5.2. And uh, the most common solution for this problem is just to use a weighted schema, a, a weighted scheme regression. So the other problem is, which is almost the same as the previous one is well-recorded earthquakes. And the solution is also here is to use weighting scheme. And again, two stage method of joiner and board also reduce the bias due to well-recorded shocks. The next problem is the obtained coefficients have to be physically realistic. So in the next lecture, we will see that what are the uh, physically realistic values for these uh, coefficients, but you cannot estimate some values that are not physically, I mean, it can uh, may cause the model to fit your data perfectly, but the point is that the coefficients that you obtain should be somehow physically realistic. So a solution to that is to use the Bayesian one stage method or to apply the constraints to the coefficients. For example, if you know that one of the coefficients should be between 0 0.8 and, uh, and 1.2, then you can constrain that coefficients to be in that range. And uh, there are some other techniques that, uh, I mean, these two are the most important one. So if you have any questions so far, please ask and uh, otherwise we can go to the next slide, which, are, which is, I guess more interesting for you. Any questions? Okay. So just Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so you, you are now familiar with general uh, information about GMPEs, but here we will uh, see how we really estimate a sort of ground motion prediction equation. It's not exactly what we were talking about, but it's a strange, <laughs> sort of a strange one. So you can somehow get familiar with the physics behind these equations. So we, uh, oops. Okay, so the, uh, everything that I say in this, in this uh, uh, lecture is from this paper and you can find everything that you need in this paper. So you don't need to take a note and, or everything. So uh, again, we have a fault and we have an earthquake and the waves propagate through the median and it affects our structures and we can feel it and it triggers the uh, sensors. So just recall you that the ground motion or seismic record recorded by our instrument is the convolution of, in time domain, it's the convolution of source time function, path effect, side effect, and instrument response. And if we go to the frequency domain, then it's just 
simply multiplication of these one. And a very simple form of ground motion prediction equation, if you take a logarithm from this equation, would be something similar to that. And uh, to the left side, you have logarithm of your uh, ground motion parameter, your uh, dependent variable. You have like AI as a function of frequency, which is source term. And I index is for earthquake and J index is for a station. So for one earthquake, you have one source term here. Then you have your path term and the path term is, uh, pa path effect is uh, composed of two different terms. One is here, which is geometrical spreading and the other one is here, which is uh, an elastic attenuation. And finally, you, you, you have your side effect. So the path effect, as you see, is the, you, you have both index of I, of I and J, because this is the distance between earthquake I and station J, also here. But for side effect, you just have J, station J. And for, again, for source term, you have the source term for earthquake I. And here you have the ground motion parameter caused by earthquake I and recorded at the station J, right? Is that clear? I want yes. to ask you yes. somehow. <laughs> okay, so. Here, I briefly introduce a, uh, a step-by-step -step estimation of the me method for estimation of those coefficients. So the first step here is to calculate the Fourier amplitude spectrum. In the, next, in the last lecture, we were talking about PGA, PGV, and uh, so the peak parameters, also the spectral parameters. And we have another spectral parameters, which is a parameter which is called FAS, or it's just simply the Fourier amplitude spectra. It's different from, uh, it's a spectral, but it's different from response spectra. And uh, so it's not very important in terms of engineering, but it can tell a lot uh, about these seismological parameters. So when we calculated our dependent parameter, FAS, then we uh, estimate the near surface attenuation, kappa. Then we estimate the site effect. In the fourth step, we try to find the location of the hinges of geometrical spreading. We will discuss all these later on. Then we will estimate the geometrical spreading coefficients. After that, we will estimate the analytic attenuation, which is inversely related to quality factor. And finally, we will estimate magnitude dependent of, uh, dependence of FAS. So these are just like a flow chart that what we are going to do, but we will uh, see the details later on. And uh, you, can, you can follow it because it's not, it's, it's a step by a step. And it's not just one regression to, it's possible to do one regression to estimate all these unknown coefficients simultaneously. But uh, this one, I guess is more informative for you. So, So here is the data set that we have used for, for uh, this study. Uh, this is Persian Gulf, this is Iraq, and this part is Iran. So these uh, dashed line are political boundaries. And uh, these uh, circles are earthquakes uh, recorded between, occurred between 1994 and two. 
2012 in the Zagros region of Iran and the stations strong, recording strong motion stations are shown by red triangles and the ray paths are also shown connecting the uh, recording stations and earthquakes. And size of the earthquakes, the size of the circles are proportional to the magnitude of the earthquakes. So we had uh, 547 three component strike motion records. And so each, which results in 1,641 waveforms recorded by 180 strong motion instruments. And the, here you can see the moment magnitude versus hypocentral distance for this study. And the magnitude, as you see, range between 3.6 and 6.1. And the hypocentral distance is between seven and 190 kilometers. So this is the data set. And up to here, we have our records. We have our catalog, which is moment magnitude distance for each of these earthquakes and uh, records. So the next step, I mean, the, the, the first step is to calculate the Fourier amplitude spectra. The general procedure used for obtaining FAS values in different frequencies are these eight steps here. So first we apply a baseline correction to the strong motion record that we have. Then we determine the S wave window based on two different criteria. So because we want to obtain all those parameters, geometrical spreading and elastic attenuation, kappa and everything for, for just for S wave, okay? Then we will uh, taper the S wave window by 5% cosine taper. We will zero path to the next greatest power of two. This is because when you want to take the Fourier ampli, uh, uh, Fourier transform, uh, you, you need to be, uh, you, you need to do this padding before that. Then we uh, transform to frequency domain by FFT. We will band pass uh, the records based on the low and high frequency noises. So I guess you remember from the last lecture that one of the criteria for data selection was based on low and high frequency noises. We will, uh, later on, we will smooth the obtained S spectra and we will pick the FAS values at 15 frequencies from 0.5 5 to 12.6. But here at, at the right, you, you'll see some, some uh, recordings. At the top, this is at the top, uh, you see the acceleration record. So do you know how we can get the velocity from, from acceleration time series? So our instrument has recorded uh, <clears throat> uh, the acceleration. How we can get the velocity from, uh, 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 how we can obtain the velocity record from that? So it's great. Quite... Yeah, great. So, and if we integrate it again, we will get the displacement, right? So, <clears throat> On top, you can see the, uh, the acceleration record. And here you see the velocity and here you see the displacement. So this figure tries to show you how filtering and how 
low and high frequency noises can affect velocity and displacement. So the gray figure here is unfiltered. We just integrated the black one. And we, if you just integrate the black one, you will get this gray trend here. And if you integrate it twice, you will get this gray trend here. But you know that our instrument is not, for example, displacement. Our instrument is not able to record the permanent displacement. OK, so when the earthquake occurs, it should change. And when the earthquake finishes, it should stay unchanged at 0. So you see that maybe the acceleration time series is not very affected by low and high frequency noises. But when you go to velocity and when you go to uh, displacement, it can be really affected by such noises. And here you can see another example. And you see that, for example, displacement can be extensively affected by uh, low frequency noise. So uh, now I will uh, explain that how we determine the S-wave window based on two different criteria. You know, in, in different, in, in the previous studies, they, they selected their own criteria to isolate the S wave velocity from P wave and from the coda wave after the S wave velocity to, to, to study just the uh, attenuation parameters of the S wave. So this uh, criterion uh, uh, has been used by different studies are so, sort of arbitrary. Some of them, uh, they uh, just, Peak when the energy reaches to uh, ninety-five percent of the whole energy, another selected eighty-five of percent of energy, and so it's uh, not a, there is not not a, a very simple single definition of the S wave window. So in this study, we try to also two different to use different criteria for. Uh, isolating the S wave window to see how it can affect affect the uh, parameters. So one method that we have adopted here is uh, from Kinoshita 1994, and uh, it used the acceleration envelope here, which is obtained by Hilbert transform, and then uh, it's calculates the cumulative RMS function here. And you can see that here, you can see an example of the record. This is the vertical component, and these two are the horizontals. And here you see, uh, you, you see the uh, cumulative RMS function as a function of time. And uh, based on this criterion, <coughs> We select the S wave window where the C starts uh, to increase. So this increase is happening here. And this increase is because of uh, arrival of the S wave. So by the way, picking the arrival of S wave is not very difficult. And uh, you can do it even simply. You, you don't need to do very complicated stuff. If you look at this record, you can somehow select that where the S wave arrival is. And even P arrival is much easier if you are not, uh, 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 if you don't care about uh, the, the arrival time to be very, very accurate. You can somehow easily pick it. But the main question is that where the S wave window terminates. That's, that's quite difficult to say. Then we, for, for, for this one, we uh, select the 
point, the time that CK starts to decrease or it's, it's reached to its ma maximum value. So you see that C increases and it reaches to a maximum here and then it starts to decrease. So we select this one, this time as termination of the S wave window based on the method of Kinoshita 1994. And we call it here after Kinoshita window. So the other method is just to take where the total, uh, where the uh, total energy of the waveform, where the, uh, where, where, uh, sorry, 85% of the total energy of the waveform is accumulated. So here, the blue line, the blue dashed line shows where the 85% uh, of the record total energy is reached. And we call it here after 85% win. So we have, for, for example, for this record, for this example record, Gray dash, uh, green dashed line is S arrival and S termination based on Kinoshita is shown by red and based on 85% <clears throat> energy uh, is uh, this blue dashed line. So, I said that we, we, we calculate the Fourier amplitude spectra. But one may ask that, how does uh, FAS look like? So if you plot FAS in a simple plot, linear, linear, you will get a figure similar to this one, more or less. If you plot it in a logarithmic scale, both the frequency and the amplitude are in logarithmic scale, you will get something similar to this one. And if you plot it in semi-lag scale, which means that your Fourier, amp your amplitude is in logarithmic scale and your frequency is, is in uh, linear scale. Your, your spectrum sh should be something similar to this one. So why we said that because it's, it's quite important to uh, know the general shape of a, uh, a spectrum. And we will use this semi-lag plot to measure the kappa in the next step. So the second step <coughs> is to estimate the near surface attenuation. You already know that this is the log linear plot of the uh, Fourier amplitude spectra, and uh, we select two frequencies, F1 and F2, and F2 is where we find the noise to be dominated. So in this figure, it's already filtered, so you cannot easily see that why F2 is here, but even here you can see that the trend is changing. But if it was not filtered, it was quite clear that the noise is dominated here and the, 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 it, it would be something like that. So we select F1 and F2 and we fit, an, we fit a straight line in log linear. And from the slope of this uh, straight line, we will estimate the kappa for this record. So we do it for all the records that we have for the three component record. So for each record, we will have a kappa value for the horizontal, two for the horizontal and uh, one for the vertical component. And if we plot the horizontal and vertical kappas estimated for each of them against their hypocentral distance, we will get a figure, the two figures like this one. So the, on the top, we have the kappa, horizontal kappa values estimated uh, uh, versus hypocentral distance. And here we uh, have the vertical kappa values again versus 
hypocentral distance. So there, oops. So you see that, that there is a sort of linear trend, roughly a linear trend here. And uh, if we fit a straight line to, to this two one, we will get this equation here for the horizontal kappa and the here for the vertical kappa. So here you see that uh, we for, for distance, if, if, if we consider the distance to be zero, the value of, and we call it kappa zero. So the kappa zero vertical kappa zero is about uh, 0 0.033. But for the horizontal, it's 0 0.042. So these two values are different. You may say that, okay, these are quite small and the difference between them is not significant, but the point is that they are statistically significant and these different dif difference is quite important. So why is that? <clears throat> Here you see our equation. And just to recall, uh, to the left, we have logarithm of the uh, ground motion parameter, which is FAS here, recorded by station J and uh, caused by, hello? Hi. Yes, okay. we are can here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I guess something happened. Okay, by the way. Uh, Hello? So everybody Sorry. can hear me. Sorry? Hey. Uh, on the previous slide. Here? Yes. Okay. I'm not understanding why you have divided by pi on this cup. Oh, sorry, I cannot hear you very well. I'm saying, hello? Hello. I'm saying. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, he's saying he said, why, you, why you divided the, the, in the couple, why you divided it by pi? Oh, for the, so this is the, the equation couple. for estimation of kappa. We fit, so this is ln of FAS. As I told you, this is in log linear form. So this is logarithmic. So this is why we have the ln FAS to the left. And we, but F is not logarithmic. F is linear here, you see? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear. Yeah. Then when you fit an S straight line, this is the S slope of the line, right? Yes. And based on the equation, you have to multiply it by minus one and divide it by pi to get the kappa. This is the definition of kappa. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So, uh, uh, so we, we saw that it turns out that this kappa zero of vertical is quite smaller than horizontal. And uh, so we were introducing this one again. So this is the uh, source term of earthquake I as a function of frequency. And this is the geometrical spreading and Rij is the distance between earthquake I and uh, station J. And this is an elastic attenuation. Uh, the red part here is the side effect at the station J. Okay. So uh, an interesting uh, paper by Motazedian, that's all 2008, if I'm not wrong. They, they argued that in the case of unequal vertical and horizontal kappa parameter, part of the near surface attenuation, which is the difference between these two, 
Okay, delta k. It's already included in the h over v ratio and should be subtracted from the attenuation term for the horizontal component. So we are going to estimate the site effect here. And we can say that, okay, the site effect is composed of two parts. One is the site amplification and the other is the near surface attenuation or kappa. So kappa that we already estimated here is combined by site amplification. And when you combine them together, you will get the site effect term over here. So the site amplification can be roughly estimated by taking the average of H over V ratio, spectral ratio. Here you can see the H over V spectral ratio. And we just took the average over frequency. And you can see that here. And this part of kappa is already incorporated here. So the SJF function has to be estimated by this equation, right? When we estimated the, S, the site effect here, we can subtract it from, uh, we, can, we can move it to the left side and we will get A prime IJF which is the Fourier amplitude spectra corrected for the site effect. So we already removed the site effect from our original Fourier amplitude spectra. And what's left to the right side is source term, geometrical spreading, and an elastic attenuation. So in the next step, we are going to find the hinges of uh, geometrical spreading. We already saw that, okay, when you correct the Fourier amplitude spectra for this site term, you will get this A prime IJ, which is site corrected amplitude spectra, and it's equal to this equation. And this is an elastic attenuation, again, uh, uh, geometrical spreading and, and the source term. There are two assumptions. The first one is that for sorry. this... Sorry. Yep. Uh, on the previous uh, slide. Previ okay, here. Okay. On... Uh, there is no two missing here on like on change of kappa not if we substitute it there there is no missing to there there is sorry no. I cannot. you see where we have change of kappa not eh? on the equation so in this slide you are talking yeah, about this, this part yeah yeah Okay. So uh, the next. Here, the second line. Yes. Okay. So um, if we substitute this, uh, the Rita Kappa knot with the, the value there, there will, there will no two appear on the third line. Oh. I cannot really understand. So you are saying yeah. that you are, you are saying yeah. that um, okay. Sorry, sir. He mean why you have uh, three line? Oh, can you just pardon me for a second? I use my uh, headphone. Maybe it would be easier to hear you.
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Yes, hello. Okay. Me, I can hear. Okay, so now now I can hear you much more clear. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay. come again. I have been saying yeah. that you see on the first line where there is delta kappa naught. Okay, kappa zero here. Okay, okay. So on the second line. Okay. I think you substituted it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, so on the third line, you? there is no missing it too. No, yeah. okay, let, let me explain it again. So we say that this side effect here, SJ, is composed of two parts. Okay, let's let, let's say that one is DJF. Let me write. Okay, this SJ is composed of two parts. One is DJ as a function of how <laughs> and right. Okay, so one is DJF, and we call it site amplification, right? But there is another term contributing to this one, to, to the site uh, term, which is, an elast uh, which is near surface attenuation and it's represented by kappa, okay? So in the last slide, we saw that the kappa for horizontal and vertical components are different, right? Right. Okay. Then when we are estimating the tight amplification, DJF, from horizontal to vertical ratio, it means that part of the kappa is already incorporated in DJF. Okay. Okay, okay. I mean, in, if, th this is just if you see that, and you, we usually see that, the kappa for horizontal and vertical components are different, then it means that part of the near surface attenuation, which is this one, the difference between two, compo two, two couples, okay? Okay, is okay. already included in H over V. Yes. Okay. And that's why we finally just use this vertical part here. Okay, okay. Okay. Oh, now. Is that clear now? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. So, uh, where are we? So, can I remove this stuff? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we were going to estimate the hinges of geometrical spreading, and we already removed these side effects from the Fourier amplitude spectra. And uh, so we got uh, A, prime ij, which is site corrected Fourier amplitude spectrum. And the contributing factors in, in this one is just uh, a source term, geometrical spreading, and an elastic attenuation. Okay, is that clear? That because this is this is a step by step. Uh, Okay, so we have two assumptions here. The first one is that for distances, these assumptions are used and introduced by Atkinson 2014, and you can see 2004, and you can see that, okay, they, they, they make sense. 
The first one is that for distances less than 100 kilometers, the geometrical spreading coefficient is assumed to be one. And the other one is that for frequencies less than two hertz and for distances short, shorter than 100 kilometers, the analytic attenuation coefficient is negligible. So here, the source term over here, based on these two assumptions, we can say that the source term of an earthquake is just the average, so this is the average, right? Of the site corrected amplitude spectra multiplied by distance, right? So where, where, where did this come from? We say that for the earthquakes for distances le le less than 100 kilometers, the geometrical spreading coefficient is one, right? So N here is one, okay? And we say that for frequencies less than two hertz and distances less than, shorter than 100 kilometer, the analytic coefficient is neglected. So we can neglect this term, right? <clears throat> then for those records and earthquakes that satisfy these two conditions, I mean, their frequency is less than two hertz and their distance is shorter than 100 kilometer, we can estimate the so the source term here by taking this average. But this is not our final estimation of the source term. We will do it just to isolate the other contributing factors here. And we will later on estimate this one again. Okay, so if we subtract the, the, the site corrected term, if, if, if we move this term, which is here, to the left side, we will have this one, which is a sort of normalized, this is source normalized site effect corrected amplitude spectrum. So what does that mean? It means that the site term is already removed in this, in this term, okay? And we say that, okay, this is the source term. This is an, a, a, an estimate of the source term. And if we subtract that from here, from this one, what we will get is what, what the, the rest is here. It's just geometrical spreading and an elastic attenuation, okay? So here you can see that how it works. On, the, on this figure, you see that the red one is A prime IJ at frequency of one Hertz. Okay. So it means that this is distance and this is logarithm of amplitude. So the side term is already removed. And when you also remove this term, which is a sort, which is a, an estimate of the source term, what you will have is just dependent on distance. The only in the independent parameters remaining here is Rij, is distance. So the blue is this one. ANIJ, the, no, the source normalized site corrected Fourier amplitude spectrum. And we see that there is a very clear trend of decreasing with distance. So as, as, as we expect, we expect the uh, amplitude to decrease with distance, right? Are you still with me? <laughs> Yes. 
Yes. yes. <laughs> so if you look at this figure, I don't know how, how can I change the, the color of this pen. Oh, great. That's it. So it's quite difficult to say that, okay, this is, this is decreasing the distance. But here you can see that, okay, this is in decreasing with distance as we expected. So the reason that we cannot see that this decreasing trend here is that the source term is still in these values. The source term is still there here. But when we remove the source term, the only remaining parameters are the distance, and we all know that the earthquake amplitude decreases by distance. We don't need to be a scientist to <laughs> uh, know that. So, but there is another point that is really the sort the, 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 the distance dependent term that simple, so geometrical spreading is just a factor multiplied by logarithm of distance, and the analytic attenuation is just a factor multiplied by distance. It can be far, I mean, it, it's quite simple to think that it's like that because you, 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 you see here at least that, that the trend is not that simple. If you remember from the last lecture, I told you that at some points, the selection criteria is to remove the uh, earthquakes, the uh, records with uh, long distances to avoid complications. So what is that kind of complication? So here you see <clears throat> a sort of profile view of the uh, an earth, and this is crust and uppermost mantle. Uh, so the crust is somehow darker brown and the uh, uppermost mantle is lighter. So this is Moho. And then we have again a fault here and an earthquake occurs. So we want to see how the uh, amplitude changes by distance. This is what we are going we are going to examine, considering that everybody knows that the Earth can be characterized by a cross and a distant continuity called uh, Moho and the uppermost mantle. So we, we will see that a schematic uh, here uh, that these are stations, and this is amplitude, and the stations are getting far and far from the earthquake. So when an earthquake occurs, first, the first stations, they got, they just received the direct body waves. After a while, after a distance, the post-critical reflections from Moho also joins the body waves. So in this range, we receive, in this range, the first part, we receive just the stations are just recording direct body waves. But in this range, from here to here, they, the, the post-critical reflections from Moho discontinuity also join the body waves. And after that, the only recorded wave is, I mean, the, the, the record is dominated by surface waves. And you know that surface wave, as their name is uh, uh, saying, it's, it's, these are surface. So just look at that again. And so short station distancing, just body wave. From here, no one, we also receive the post-critical reflections. And after another, for very far distances, the only, the, the, the surface waves, will dominate the record. So we have two hinges. This is our amplitude trend with distance, okay? 
we have two hinges. One is here, R1, at, at R1, a distance of R1, and the other is at R2. What is the R1 hinge? This is the distance that the post-critical reflections from Moho start to join the direct body waves. And at distances shorter than R1, the record is just dominated by body waves in this region. And R2 is where the surface waves start to dominate the record. So do you remember that in the last lecture, we, we said that we our estimations of the coefficient should be physically reasonable? You already know from theory that body waves, they propagate as frequently and as a result, their analytic, uh, their geometrical spreading is theoretically one. Yeah. Great. So we also know that from theory that the, oh, this one is actually zero. I always forget to correct this. <laughs> So for the surface waves, the wave propagates cylindrically and the geometrical spreading factor is 0 0.5. This is what we already know from theory. But that simple equation, do you remember this simple equation? with only one geometrical spreading and one analytic attenuation term can be much more sophisticated because of because of presence of these two hinges okay so for distances smaller than r1 the equation is as simple as we have Okay, this is source term, an elastic uh, geometrical spreading, an elastic attenuation, and side effect. So, this is the general uh, three linear for functional form. Okay, so for distances between R1 and R2, when the post-critical reflections join the uh, uh, body waves and somehow amplifies that, we expect our geometrical spreading to increase to, to decrease. Okay, and it somehow results in the geometrical spreading to be zero. Okay. But here, for distances between R1 and R2, our equation would be like that. So we have the source term again here. We have the geometrical spreading for the first part here. Here, we have the geometrical spreading for this region between R1 and R2 here and an elastic attenuation and size. For distances beyond R2, this is the same source term, geometrical spreading for this part, geometrical spreading for this part, and geometrical spreading for distances beyond R2. And again, this is and elastic attenuation and side. Okay, any question up to here? Can you still hear me <laughs> at some point? I... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so is that clear? 
for everybody? If you're not sleeping, that just let me know if it's clear. <laughs> Okay, so back to the procedure here. Again, uh, the, these two markers, uh, red circle and blue triangles are side corrected terms. And here the, the, the for, for two different window, S wave windows. And here you can see that one again, for, but this one is the, showing with cross, is when we corrected for this source term as well, but this is just, just for uh, two hertz. But if you apply a sort of smoothing on the crosses, you will get this trend over here, and uh, this is for different periods. The gray scale is for different periods. So the lighter is for higher frequencies and the, the darker is for uh, uh, shorter frequencies. And as I said, you can clearly see that the trend here is the, the, you have a decreasing trend of amplitude with distance. And if you remember, we had two hinges. And just, just looking at the, this figure, we can say that, okay, one hinge is over here and the other hinge is over here. And why is that? Because the trend of decreasing is somehow changing in this region. But it's quite easy to, to say that. And one may say that, okay, no, the first hinge is not here. I say it's here. And the second hinge is not here. I say it's here. And nobody can say that, okay, this is true or this is wrong. So that's why we, uh, we applied in the fifth, fifth step, we applied the Bayesian uh, uh, regression to find the geometrical spreading hinges. So, you already remember that we had the, I don't know if you remember this equation, the final equation here. So we already have these terms here. Okay, and we want to estimate them. But the point is that the equation is more complicated. K is as simple as this one, but n is different for different parameters. So we have n1, n2, n3, r1, and r2 to be estimated. So r1, r2, n1, n2, and n3 are the geometrical spreading factors to be estimated, and r1 and r2 are called hinges. So here, we apply a Bayesian regression, and you can see that in, in, in here, we, N1, you can see the scatter plot of N1, N2, N3, K, R1, and R2. And this here shows you the estimated values for R1 and R2 as a function of frequency for different window types. So you can see that R1 is somehow fluctuating at about 65 for all the frequencies. And R2 is also, also something about 125 for all the frequencies. We, fix the R1 and R2 coefficients <clears throat> and apply the Bayesian regression again here. So R1 and R2 are considered as noun. So we fix them at the values that we got here. Okay, and we estimate the N1, N2, and N3 
and also kappa is free, but we are not, uh, I mean, oh, excuse me, K. And elastic attenuation is also free and it's not fixed. And this is the values that, these are the values that we obtained from for N1, N2, and N3 as a function of frequency for different window types. Okay, is that clear up to here? Still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we estimate N1, N2, N3, and R1 and R2, and when, uh, and then, uh, Okay, in the next step, so do you remember we had this term, which was amplitude spectra corrected for sight. Okay, then we obtained also all the unknown parameters here, which were, so I, I didn't write all the equations because it can be complicated. So. We sort of, we, we obtained all the geometrical spreading coefficients as well, okay? Which was N1, N2, N3, R1, and R2. I, I simply wrote the sim simplest uh, form here, okay? So this is also now, and this is now, and we move that to this side. And what is remaining is source as an, an elastic attenuation. Right? The remaining part is source and an elastic attenuation. Are you following me? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Okay. So I have a question for you guys, and I expect you to answer it. So at some point, we remove the source term by taking the average of. Uh, values less than two hertz and short and distances shorter than 100. So why do we have the source term still here? Any idea? So you can still say that I don't know. <laughs> Otherwise, I think that you are changing of that and I, I, I wait for your answers. Okay, so. Here, we estimated roughly the source term and we removed that from here. And then we use that to estimate the geometrical spreading. Okay. As soon as we have the geometrical spreading estimated, just, just look at here. This is a normalized. Here, we are not considering the a normalized again. So we have a prime which was only corrected for side term, right? And now we correct it for geometrical spread. So I said that that estimation of source term was just a rough estimation to isolate the path effect, but that was not the final estimation of the source term. So the source term is still here, but the site term and the geometrical spreading terms are already corrected and we got this one, double prime, a double prime. So at a given frequency, even with the same moments lead to the same source spectrum, okay? They are, they, 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 their magnitude are the same, their moment are the same, so that their source spectrum should be also the same. 
These are the facts. For a given moment, an elastic attenuation is simply equal to the slope of A double prime, which is here, versus distance. Am I right? Is that clear? So we have a line here. If you plot this one against distance, you have a straight line here. And when you fit a line to that one, you can simply estimate Kf as the S slope. And Kf, which is an elastic attenuation, is inversely related to quality factor. So here you see the quality factor for different window types and uh, a linear frequency dependent uh, trend fitted to them. And uh, you see that at higher frequencies in this region, the, the, the results are somehow different, but at shorter frequencies or middle frequencies, the results are almost the same. So we have obtained the geometrical spreading, kappa, we corrected the amplitude for geometrical spreading source, oh, sorry, site, uh, an elastic attenuation. And if we move this term, to the left side, the only remaining term is the source. So <clears throat> here, here it's, it's uh, again, and how we remove the uh, an elastic attenuation. And do you remember from the last lecture that the source effect can be characterized by an exponential, a, a, a linear term, and also this term, which was magnitude saturation, right? You remember it from the last picture? So these are the terms and a fixed term. And we were not going to estimate the source parameters here. So we simply fitted this model to the source spectra. And here, it, it, this shows the uh, coefficients that we obtained from uh, for the two different windows and their uncertainties as well here. And so here, this is the equation that we were going to estimate the unknown parameters of that. And we already, obtain this term, source term, which can be calculated by, by putting A1, A2, N, and A3, and N. And we have N, we have estimated, so this is done, this is done, this is done. R1 and R2 are also estimated. N1 and N2 and N3 and an elastic attenuation, and they, they are all estimated. So we want to see that if we put, how this um, estimation is, uh, how, how good is this estimation? And we, we want to evaluate the regression that we have done. So we put uh, the independent variables in the equation, and we compare it with the observations, OK? For example, if, if I put uh, for, for frequency of uh, 0 0.5, if I, put, uh, if I consider Rij to be 50 kilometer and the magnitude to be, I don't know, uh, 5, then it will give me Fourier amplitude uh, spectra at of an earthquake with magnitude of five at distance of 50 or 100 kilometer or whatever I want. And I have those values from observations. So observations minus estimations. And this is residual. So 
this plot shows that our observation and estimations are somehow uh, good because the average is around zero. So it means that our model is not overestimating or underestimating the values at short term, uh, at, at this uh, peri uh, period or frequencies. But for example, at this frequency, well, as, uh, at 1.3, you see that at larger distances, our model is somehow uh, underestimating because the observation overestimation or observation minus estimation is uh, uh, positive. So it means that the observation is larger than our estimation, okay? So it means that our fitting is not very well here at this uh, uh, frequency or here. And for, for magnitude, this is the same plot for different frequencies, but the variation with magnitude. You see that, okay, this one is also good because it's symmetrical and it's about zero, around zero. And, uh, but at very high frequencies, like 10 Hertz, you see that again, observation minus estimation is positive. So it means that observation is larger than estimation. And uh, it means that our model is underestimating the FAS values around here. So this is how we finally check our model to see how valid is that. So just to recall the uh, things that we discussed in this lecture, the distance dependence of horizontal and vertical components are shown here. And, and you, you saw that the zero distance kappa for vertical and horizontal components are different. You saw that, okay, the, we, we have a sort of a trilinear trend of geometrical spreading. We found that the hinges to be at uh, 65 kilometer and 120 kilometer and the geometrical spreading around here is about zero as we expected theoretically. It's around one as we expected for the body waves here and it's around 0 0.5 as we expected for the surface wave. So if you remember from the last lecture, we, we were talking that, okay, the values that we obtain should be physically reasonable and realistic. For example, for this one, we cannot get a value of, I don't know, 3.6, because it doesn't make sense. It should be physically reasonable. So for, for realistic, for, we expect it to be one and it's around one. And it, it, we expect it to be 0 0.5 and it's about 0 0.5. Five. So uh, that's it. Any question? <clears throat> Are you still there? Okay, you still have. So, uh, did you uh, have you? Uh, do you have access to MATLAB? I wrote, I wrote you at some point. All of you have access to MATLAB? Um, not yet, I'm yet to install it. So why did, did you, so you, you are- no. uh, Yeah, I will install it um, on my own. I can, I want to install it on my personal machine. Okay, you didn't yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please do that. And uh, so by, I, I don't know, the, the, the next lecture will be tomorrow, right? I guess it's at 11 tomorrow. Or I have to yes. say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's okay. morning. So uh, please get it uh, ready, your MATLAB ready. I don't know, for those of you that uh, are at ICTV, I guess you can use the lab, I don't know, but you can. Uh, consult with the diploma office if 
to see what's the solution. But uh, from probably tomorrow, or I don't know, maybe so, maybe the last two uh, lessons, you need to get your hands dirty on MATLAB and we will start to write some, some codes and manipulate some code. So you need to have to access to MATLAB. Okay. Great. So any questions? Okay, hope that it was clear. <laughs> and uh, okay, that's it. So see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank See you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.